Welcome to Love the Truth Media, a teaching ministry of Pastor Steve Wiseman of Peewee Valley Baptist Church in Peewee Valley, Kentucky. To learn more about the many resources available through this ministry, visit us online at lovethetruthmedia.com. And now, here's Pastor Steve to continue our verse-by-verse study in the Gospel of John. Today, and I I really appreciate um, all of our music this morning, particularly the song that the choir sung this morning, because it fits in with our lesson today uh, very appropriately. Not that, not that the others don't as well, but to feel at home in this world uh, is really a sin for the believer, to feel at home. And I wonder oftentimes if, we're, if we don't, if you know, we understand what the right answer is, and we're going to talk about that today, but we live in this world by way of our practical application of our life as if the world is our home and, and if, if we are at home in this world. And it can't be that way. We're going to talk this morning about faith uh, versus walking by sight. Um, so John chapter 6, uh, we're going to be studying the first 14 verses this morning. So turn your attention uh, two, verse 1, and we'll read these uh, first four, 14 verses. And stand with me if you're able to. Uh, if not, you can just remain seated. Verse 1 of John chapter 6. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on those who were diseased. And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. At the Passover, a feast of the Jews was nigh or near. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred pennyworth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here who hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? And Jesus said, Make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were um, set down, and likewise of the fishes, as much as they would. When they were filled, he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore they gathered them together, and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above that which they had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth that prophet that should come into the world. Father, we thank you for your love and for your grace, for your mercy. We thank you for your word. Thank you that if you've given us this opportunity to study your word and that we might make ourselves available to be convicted by your word of error that would be in our life, of the sins that uh, have beset us. And Father, we just ask that you would lead and guide us into the truth through the presence of the Holy Spirit. And Father, that he would guide us into the truth. We thank you, Father, for it's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen. You may be seated. I've titled this sermon a little longer the title than I usually do, so I'll have to read it because I wrote it down. Do you really live by faith, or is it just the right thing to say? Do you really live by faith? And that's what we're going to examine today, if we are really living by faith. And we're going to use this text that we just read to demonstrate that, and we're going to go to a couple other places in Scripture. But we say we live by faith. We understand Ephesians 2.8 says, For by faith are you saved through grace. And we know that when we repent of our sins as an unbeliever and put our faith in Christ, He saves us. But when we, when we look at Matthew chapter 7, it says there's a whole lot of people out there that are calling on the Lord, as I paraphrase, but God doesn't even know them. That is, He doesn't know them through faith in Christ. So then there's a disconnect for a lot of people because there's a lot of people that say they have faith in Christ, they believe Christ, but they don't. 
And that's why I, I really like this song about uh, we should no longer feel at home in this world. And too many of us are walking by sight. Even after being saved by the grace of God, there is a tremendous temptation for us to abandon our faith in God and to walk by sight. We want to talk about that. So I've divided this text up into three parts. The first four verses I call the crowd followed Jesus based on sight. It's in our text. The crowd followed Jesus based on sight. Look at the second verse. It says, And a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles which he did on those who were diseased. They followed him because he was healing people. He had changed the water into wine. And he was teaching them these great, great truths. But their primary motivation was they had seen what he could do. Well, it's sort of like if somebody were to give you a genie in a bottle and you understood that you could get the three wishes out of the, the genie, you might open that thing up and have a tendency to do that. And this sort of has that kind of a, of a thought to the mind of the world, and that is, here's a guy walking around, and he can perform miracles. We want to follow him. Many, no doubt, just followed because of the, of the wonder of the miracles themselves. What, a, what an amazing thing that, and we just saw in chapter 5, was a man that was paralyzed for 38 years and instantaneously Jesus told him to take up his bed and walk and he was miraculously healed. So when you see that right before your own eyes, you want to sort of go along and find out what else is he going to do. Just amazed by what you've seen. And then there are others who believe that he is the Messiah that God sent. But we know that the majority of people are not with faith in Christ. And that's true of the multitude here as well. So what they were do, what they were doing is walking by sight. It says the great multitude followed him. And we understand that there later in the book of John, Jesus says, and many of them no longer followed him because of his sayings. They loved the miracles but it was hard to follow in obedience to his teaching. And they didn't want that part. They only want the good part. There's a lot of people like that. When they get down and out, when they hurt, when they have pain, when they have disease, when they have failure in some area of their life, they want to turn to the Lord who, can, who they think they can help them and say, help me. That's not faith. That's not faith. Faith is faith in Christ that you, you realize you're a sinner because there's none righteous, no, not one. There's not one that doeth good. And you, and you understand and being convicted by the Word of God that you're a sinner and that Christ is sent to be the Savior of the world and the only way that you can be redeemed from your sin is through the shed blood of Christ. And so you put your faith in Him, having repented of your sins and turning to Christ, turning your back on sin, and then you're saved by the grace of God. It's not a magic formula. You don't have to do any work. Because Ephesians 2.9 says that the salvation is not by works. But we know that once you're saved, you will perform the good works of God. That's what the scripture says. John 15 says that we'll bear fruit, more fruit, much fruit, after we're saved by the grace of God. Because we're grafted into the vine who is Christ. And when we have the lifeline to Christ, Christ is in us, His Power is in us. His Word is in us. The Holy Spirit is in us. And so we can do greater things than people who aren't saved by the grace of God. Now, so we got the, the, scene, the scene here is that Jesus had been teaching uh, this multitude. And, and as He was teaching them, I mean, between chapter 5 in, in John and chapter 6 is all of Matthew 5, 6, and 7 where Jesus had that great sermon on the mount, the, the Beatitudes and, and, and following. And so all of that teaching, and the multitudes had gathered around him. And he, had, in fact, left the multitudes to go over the sea, but there were many that followed him they, because of the miracles he had done, because what they had seen, they were following him. He had fed them, he had healed them. He'd made provisions where they didn't have a way. 
And so they were following him. And uh, it says there in verse 2, they followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on those who were diseased. And John, no doubt, is particularly having in mind here the paralytic man from the previous chapter. But <clears throat> um, uh, take a look at Matthew chapter 14 and verse 15. By the way, this is the only um, uh, time that something is mentioned in all of the gospel, is, or at least it is mentioned in all the gospels, and it's a very critical uh, story that John gives to give further evidence to the fact that Jesus is the Messiah. It says here in Matthew chapter 14 and verse 15, a couple of more facts as we set the stage here. It says, um, and when it was evening, so it was evening then. So it was late in the day. It says his disciples came to him saying, this is a desert place and the time is now uh, literally late. It's past. So they were, they were in a desert place in a remote area. It was late in the day and... Um, it says, send the multitude away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves victuals. That's food. So it's late. They're in a remote location where there's no place. There's no, not a McDonald's or Wendy's on a corner there. And they're hungry. They've been following him all day long. They are literally hungry. And, and no doubt when you take the full text in mind, it's probable that many of them would have fainted and perhaps not even made it to the next day uh, with the strength they had because they were without food for some time now, uh, having followed uh, Jesus. Now, I want to turn to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1 and use this uh, because it is, it is appropriate to our text here because this multitude, as our text says, followed Jesus because of what they saw. Because of what they saw. Now, you know, here's a case in point. There are lots of mega churches who, who, who utilize in their services an apparent miracle service. They supposedly parade people on one side of the stage and they heal them and then they parade them off the other side of the stage. And they just come in droves and they come and people see that happening and they follow those leaders because of what they see. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1 says, Now faith, because faith is required for salvation. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Literally, um, what we find here is this word assurance means is the equivalent of, of having a title deed to something. If you have a house and you've purchased, let's take a vehicle. If you buy a vehicle, you make payments on it, and then at the end of the payment cycle, the bank or the, the institution that loaned you the money, they're going to send you the title because you don't actually possess the title until it's paid for in full. And when that vehicle is paid for in full, you get a title to the vehicle. It's now yours. Before you pay it off, it belongs to the people that loaned you the money. And you say, well, this is my car. It's not yours if you still owe money on it and there's a lien on your title. But when you've paid it off, you have a title. Now, for faith, faith is that title deed of things that are hoped for. Now, the things that are hoped for represent future reality. Faith in Christ represents a title deed for a future reality. Our future reality, we sang about this morning, we sang about it last Sunday, and that is heaven itself. We have an inheritance in Christ. We're joint heirs with Christ. And we have a title deed just as, as if we bought a car and got it in our hand and it's better than that. We have a, and, and when you have a house that's totally paid for, you get the title to the house and you actually have a deed to the house because you own it outright. We have, according to John 14, we have a place in heaven that is prepared for us. Better than any house on, in this world, as Abraham said, he's looking for a house not built on a foundation here on earth. Right? We're looking for that heavenly home. And we have 
by faith the title deed to heaven. We've got the title deed. That's what faith is. Secondly, it says there, it's the evidence of things not seen. Evidence is proof. It's proof. And the things that are not seen are those that are divinely assured to us by God. And that's what faith is. We put faith in the Lord and He, there is proof. The faith in Christ is the proof that God has divinely assured us and guaranteed us of that future reality. That's what faith is. It has nothing to do with sight. Nothing at all to do with sight. Now, if you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7, to put this together, and we're going to get back to our text in a couple of minutes. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, the Scripture says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. Now that's important. Remember the multitude in our text. They followed Jesus because they saw the miracles that He had done. You don't follow Christ because you've seen something. I know I can lean on this podium because when I look at it, it looks sturdy, it's made out of wood, it's got some legs on it, and I know I can lean on it. It doesn't take any faith to do that. But when somebody says the stove's hot, it takes faith to believe them because you can't see it unless you got one of these modern uh, appliances where you can see a globe on there. Faith. It's not by sight. And we don't live our life by sight. We live our life by faith according to the Scripture there. Now look at over at 11, um, chapter 11 in Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11. We saw the beginning of chapter 11. I want to look at the end of chapter 11 in Hebrews. We're talking about living by faith and not by sight. In Hebrews 11 and verse 39, the Scripture says, And these all, these all what? All the way back to the days of Noah and Abraham and Moses and all of the, uh, the forefathers, or a lot of the forefathers who are characterized in chapter 11 of Hebrews as being in the hall of faith, if you will. They all demonstrated real, genuine faith. They didn't walk by sight. They walked by faith. And in Hebrews 11.39, these all, having literally received, obtained, it says, received witness through faith. It says, received not the promise, and that is, they didn't receive the They operated on faith. They didn't see anything to get it. You know, there's one, there's a story in the Scriptures about how one, you know, goes to, to hell and, and, and he's in torment. And he looks and he says, oh, send somebody that my five brothers won't end up in the same place. And oh, by the way, give me a drop of water on my tongue because it's hot here and I'm burning up. And there are a lot of people that feel if they could just open up a lid. Oh, look at all those people in hell. Well, there's nobody in hell yet. It doesn't happen until after the thousand year reign. And that's when they're thrown into the lake of fire. You can't lift up the lid now. We have to walk by faith. You don't open up a hatch and see it. Oh, I don't want to go in there. And if you did that, then he still wouldn't believe. As Christ says that I, you know, I sent Moses and all these other prophets to you and Isaiah, and you didn't believe them. Jeremiah preached for 30 years and nobody believed him. Noah preached for 120 years and nobody believed him. So who's going to believe something if they see it? We've seen the Word of God, and it's the most powerful thing we have. Not some vision of what we can see. Faith really requires us not to see things, but to believe in our heart. Now, so just a couple of things there. Uh, while we're in uh, Hebrews 11, look at verse 7. It says, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear. Being warned of God, he was moved with fear. He wasn't moved by the sight of the rain that came. There are a lot of beautiful ways, well, you know, when it rains, I'll do it. I'll, I'll take a look. You show me some rain. For it had never rained before. It had never rained before. God says, build a boat. <laughs> Noah's, build a boat, you know. He didn't say, well, what do I need that for? I don't see any reason for that. You see, that's the way we would be. We would look around and say, well, I don't find any reason to do that. That seems kind of stupid. 
If I start building an ark in my yard, what do you think my neighbors are going to say? You think Noah was worried about that? He was moved with a reverential fear of God because God warned him directly. He didn't wait for the rain. Most of us wouldn't just wait for the rain. We'd wait for the rain to get so deep that we was, now, okay, now I'm concerned for my life. The water's up to here. What happens when people are warned to move out of their areas when a hurricane comes or flood warnings come? Move, get out of your home, evacuate. No, I'm going to wait and see. And they end up on the roof somewhere because they didn't believe what they were told. Noah simply believed God. That's what we need to do. We need to believe. When God says something in His Word, we need to put faith in it. We don't need to wait. We don't need to wait for some proof that we can see or some evidence in, around, in the people that, we're, that we live with or that we ha hang out with or that we enjoy time with. Abraham in verse 8, um, he went to a land by faith that he had never seen before. He had never seen the land. God says, go. And so Abraham just picks up and goes. He hadn't seen the land. He didn't know what was over there. And oh, by the way, in those days, they didn't have GPS. They didn't have maps. They didn't have videos on CNN headline news. They didn't even know if the world was flat or round. God says, go. Abraham said, okay, Lord. You obey what the Lord says regardless of what you see. You might look around and say, why do I need to leave this place? It looks like a perfectly good place to me. Many of us are like that. And just one more I'll pick out, and you can look through the whole hall of faith. But Moses, Moses, and I'm not going to turn there, but in Exodus 14, verses 13 to 21, Moses lifted up the rod at the Red Sea because that's what God told him to do. He was between the rocky place where they couldn't escape the Egyptian army that was bearing down upon them, soon to kill them, no doubt, they were at the mercy of God. Because they were no match for the Egyptian army and their chariots and their warriors. And they were up against a mountain, and then they had the sea. There was no way of escape. God says, go forward with your rod and point it at the Red Sea. Lift up your rod at the Red Sea. You think Moses could envision? He didn't know what the waters were going to do. <laughs> he didn't know that he'd be able to lead his people, but he told the people to start marching towards the sea. He would look like a foolish leader when they got to the shore and got their feet wet, wouldn't he? And they say, well, the Lord's going to deliver us, and you get up to your knees, and you get up to your waist. Not the way it is. Because Moses moved by faith and lifted up the rod, God parted the waters and they went on dry land. Amen. And the, the most amazing part is that after they got through on dry land, the Egyptians were right on their heels. God swallowed them up with the water and killed them all. It's amazing. By faith. But if Moses had been walking by sight, he'd have tried to fend off the best that he could. But he had faith. How much faith do we really have? Or are we walking by sight? Let's go back to our text then. So we see in the first four verses that the crowd followed Jesus based on sight. Secondly, beginning in verse 5 of our text, um, the disciples looked for solutions in what they saw. They looked for solutions in what they saw. Sort of happens to us, doesn't it? When we're in a predicament, <clears throat> when, when it seems like there's, there's no help, what do we do? We, we look around and say, oh, what are our resources? First thing we do, let's, let's see what we got. Where's the faith? So we get in a predicament, we start looking for how we can solve the problem. Yet Peter said, cast your cares on the Lord because He cares for you. Now what we're going to see here um, might surprise us a little bit. But let's take a look at it. Verse 7. Uh, Philip. Philip answered him, because in verse 6, um, <clears throat> it says, and this he said, Jesus said, to prove him, that is uh, Philip, because in verse 5, he says to Philip, 
where shall we buy bread that they may eat? And he said this to test Philip. The word prove means to test him. And so in, um, in verse 7, because Jesus already knew what Philip was going to do, right? Verse 7, Philip answered him, 200 pennies worth, that's denarii's worth, of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may take a little. One penny worth, one penny worth is a day's wages in that day. 200 pennies worth is 200 days wages. That's about eight months of wages. That's a lot of money. Take your salary, eight months of it. Are you going to get that? And that's how much it would cost. Philip estimated the cost of what it would take in order to provide enough food for the people. That is if they could go buy it. They're out in a desert place somewhere. So Jesus says to him, where are we going to buy bread that these may eat? Jesus didn't intend for him to count how much money they had or how much money it might take to do it. Jesus was saying, where, where are you going to buy it? There's no place to buy it. There's no place. They're not in a town. And about the reason that they're hungry is because they're not going to go back. It's late at night. They're in a very remote area. They're not going to go back to the towns and places and maybe not even to their hometown and try to find something to eat. So uh, Philip basically says there's not enough money. Um, it says in verse 7, Philip answered him, that is Jesus, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them. We don't have enough money. Jesus didn't say, do we have enough money? See, we assume things sometimes. Jesus said in verse 5, where shall we buy bread that they may eat? Where are we going to get it? Philip's thinking mon monetarily. We do that many times. Situations come up in our life and we think uh, maybe the Lord's requiring us something to do. The Lord's got something for us to go, someplace for us to go. And we say, Lord, I don't have enough money to do that. Have we, have, have we ever said that to the Lord? I don't have enough money. I don't have enough gas in the car. I don't have enough change in the pocket. I don't have enough time to do it. We use all kinds of excuses. Philip said we don't have enough money to buy the bread. That's what he says. If we had uh, uh, two, uh, uh, eight months worth of wages here, we wouldn't have enough money to buy bread for all of these people that every one of them may take just a little bit. He's thinking about just take all that money, just give everybody a little bit. That wouldn't even suffice them. There's no way possible, Lord, to do it. He's walking by sight. He's looking at the money. He's looking at the resources. And he says, we don't have enough, Lord, we can't feed them. Secondly, we got Andrew in verses 8 and 9. And basically what Andrew says is, we don't have enough food. It says, one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said unto him, there is a lad here who hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? We don't have enough food, Lord. We can't feed them. We don't have a... He heard Philip, no doubt. We don't have enough money to buy food. And oh, by the way, there's not enough food here to supply everybody. Didn't Jesus prove that wrong? What was, what was uh, Andrew looking at? Andrew was looking at the five loaves and the two fishes. He was walking by sight. That's what he saw. What he saw de determined the course of action that he would recommend. What course of action did they recommend? Look at Mark chapter 6 and verse 35. Mark chapter 6 and 30. Mark, Mark chapter 6, verse 35. It still accounts of the same story. Mark 6, 35, And when the day was now far spent, his disciples came unto him, this included Philip and Andrew, and said, This is a desert place, and now the time is far past, that is, it's late in the day. Send them away! That'll solve the problem, Lord! Send them all away! <laughs> is that what they said? 
Send them away. Why? That they may go to the country round about and into the villages and buy themselves bread for they have nothing to eat. We don't have enough money. We don't have enough food. Just send them away. Tell them to go away, Lord. Well, the reason all those people were there, the reason the Lord had healed the people, the reason the Lord was about to feed the people, the reason the Lord taught the people is because of His love, because of His compassion. Where's the compassion in this solution? And oh, by the way, this seems to be a group solution. Because it says um, uh, in verse 35, And when the day was now far spent, His disciples came unto Him, and they said, Send them away. So it was a group decision. Lord, send them away. Doesn't that solve the problem? I don't have a problem anymore, Lord. They all go in to buy their own food. Praise the Lord. Let's just sit back and take a nap. We sit back in the easy chair too much. But again, because of what they saw, they saw a great multitude, not enough money, not enough food. Oh, there are some towns over here. We know about them. Send them into the town that they can buy them some food. Um, they couldn't raise enough money. Andrew, in our text, in chapter 6 of John and verse 9, he didn't know what to do. There's a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fishes. What are they most? He didn't know what to do. He had no idea what to do. So, takes us to our last few verses, uh, verses uh, 10 to 14. And here what we find is what I call Jesus proved that solutions come from faith, not from what is seen. Solutions come from faith. How many decisions do we make on a weekly basis that are based on sight instead of faith? How many decisions? First thing we do is look at the checkbook. We look at other resources we might have. We look at people. Do we have enough people to help us? It's just me, Lord. How many times have you said that? I, it's just me. I can't do it. That's like Moses. Moses said, I can't lead these people out of uh, Egypt. I can't do that. Sometimes we think we're insignificant. It's not that... And, and, and we are insignificant until we're saved by God's grace and then God lives in us. That's significant. Because God's power is residing in us we can do great things, but only if we operate on faith instead of by sight. So look at verse 11 in our text. It says, Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples and disciples to them that were set down, and likewise to the fishes as much as they would. First thing is, what Jesus does is he takes the loaves and the fish as what was available. He took what was available, right? That's what, that was what was available. They had five loaves and two fishes. That's what they had available. The second thing he did in verse 11 is he prayed. We say, well, Jesus is God. He doesn't have to pray. Oh, yeah. Philippians chapter 2 says he submitted himself to be in obedience to the Father. He came to set an example for what Christ's likeness looks like and he became obedient to the Father. So Jesus took upon himself the form of a man and became the, and, and was a servant. And so in that sense, he looks to the Father because he said, and, and later on in John we'll study it, I came to do the will of my Father. If you're going to do the will of your Father, you pray and you thank. He gave thanks to God for the food they were about to receive. When's the last time you were bold enough to pray and thank God for that which you, didn't, you don't have yet? That's faith. That's faith. There's a need. There's a legitimate need here. I'm not talking about just doing something, well, Lord, I'm going to thank you for transporting me to the foyer without walking there. That's foolishness. We do some crazy things like that in our life. We ask God to do things for us where there's no actual need. Where there's an actual need. Jesus gave thanks to the Lord 
for the food they were about to receive. And oh, what a generous provision God made. So not only did he pray, but there in verse 11 as well, he began the distribution of the food. Now keep in mind, there's one basket, there's five loaves, and there's two fish. He told his disciples to go and distribute. In verse 11 it says, When he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise to the fishes, as much as they would. So Jesus gives the basket to the disciples, and somewhere between Jesus handing it off and giving to the first person, this stuff began multiplying. See, we're not willing to operate on faith. We've got to figure it all out first. We've got to do like Andrew and Philip and the other disciples did, and sort of go through a checklist and say, no, nah, can't do that, can't do that, can't do that. Ha, that's it. Send them away. That'll solve the problem. What did Jesus do? Jesus fed them. He fed them. If we had faith in Christ, there's a lot of things that God would do through us that He's not doing now because we're walking by sight. And then in verse 12, it says, and when they were filled, they were filled. All of them. Five loaves. Now, uh, it says here at the end of verse 10 that there were about 5,000 men there. That doesn't count the women and children, according to uh, an account in over in, of one of the other Gospels. In fact, um, uh, according to that, um, it says that it's not, done, not counting the, the, men and, the women and children. So when you add 5,000 and count women and children on average, it's estimated, it's estimated there's about 20,000 people there. They're out in the field. They're on a mountaintop. They're, they're out in a remote area. There's 20,000 people. Women, I'll, I'll look at you now and say, what if you had 20 people come into dinner at your house at 2 o'clock this afternoon? Would that give you cause for concern? <laughs> it would if you're walking by sight. But if there was a, an absolute need, I'm not talking about just sort of getting together to have some fun. If there was an absolute need... God would supply if you walk by faith. Make decisions by faith. Now, can you imagine that 20,000 people showed up at your house this afternoon at 2 o'clock for dinner? Think about that. How many people does the Yum Center hold? I've, never, I've been in there one time. and It's about 17,000, 20,000 people, I guess. And it was full the other, I guess, last night. Not last night, but last week. For the basketball games there. I have a friend who was there. He sent a picture. There was a lot of people there. That's about how many were at this place when they only had five loaves and two fishes. Jesus is here. Take this and go start feeding them. And there they went. They were all filled. And verse 13 tells us there was, there was much left over. And in verse 14, and then those men, then, then after the people were fed and they were filled... Then, those men, when they had seen, this is the 5,000 men, along with their families, those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, this is of a truth, that prophet, that should come into the world. When they had seen the miracle, verse 2 says, because they saw his miracles. There's no change from verse 2 to verse 14. They would continue to follow him, and they did, the multitudes, because of what they had seen. But when he spoke the difficult words of Scripture that we have to live by as a, true, a person who has true faith in God, many of them no longer walked with him because they weren't living by faith. They were living by what they had seen. And so <clears throat> I want you to I'll look at uh, Luke chapter 9 and verse 13 as we close. Luke chapter 9 and verse 13. When Jesus gave them the, the, the five loaves and the two fish, as he began to hand that out, what did he say to the disciples? Give them to eat. Give them to eat. That was a command from the Lord. 
And God enabled them to fulfill that command. It wasn't apparent that you could actually achieve that. It wasn't something that you could sit down on a calculator and say, yep, yeah, I think we got it covered. It's not something that you could even envision from that small basket of food. But yet, Jesus says, give them to eat. Now, if we're truly saved by grace through faith, that, may lead, that means that we believe in the God of creation who can do anything and everything. Now, we wouldn't burden God down with frivolous things, like should I part my hair on the other side? But what we would do when there's a need, when Jesus says, go and feed them, we're going to go. We're not going to look. We're not going to look and make a determination about whether we should do it on what we have or what's, or what's around us. We're not going to use those visual clues as factors in our decision process. What we are going to do, we're going to understand that faith in God is a title deed. And it's literally confidence and assurance that God's going to perform it. God's not going to command us to do anything that He won't enable us to do. It's a fact. God won't command us to do anything. He won't motivate us or urge us or push us in a direction that God won't enable. Now, we've got to stop for a second and think about that because when God says, as He did here, give them to eat, even if we don't look at our resources, we're going to be thinking one thing. There's not enough in there. There's just not enough. We don't need to go look at everything else God says, go feed them. We know what's there, and we're going to be thinking, it's not enough. It's not enough. It's not enough. It is enough. It is enough. Because we're still basing it on what we know and what we see. And what we know is, ba is based on what we've seen. <clears throat> and so, when God gives us an, an expectation to go feed them, do we actually believe that God's going to do and enable? Now, so we envision results. And it's sort of what like Philip did. He said, we, we get all this money together. If we could get all this, we could raise enough money. If, you know, churches that go into sort of fundraising thing. If we raise all this money, we can do it. So we need to raise all this money and go do it. And, Pete, and Philip was sort of saying, even if we raise all this money, it's not going to be enough to do it. But when God says, give them to eat, we should understand that there is a result. Don't try to envision what the result's going to be. Don't try to do that. That'll interfere with our walking by faith. We try to visualize. People will tell us in this world, visualize success. You know what happens when we do that? We visualize something that looks like success. And so when Jesus says, go feed them, and when we get there and get it done, we say... Well, that's not what I thought it would look like. So we don't consider it to be a success because we don't have faith. Understand that all things work together for good to those who love God, are called according to His purpose. So when God says go do it, and we go do it in faith, whatever the result is, it's God's doing. It's not ours. Then we've got to go back to the beginning and say, so God says go Give them to eat. Uh, is that really God speaking to us? Or is it some selfish desire? Is it some passion we have? Is it some interest we have? Is it some idea that we concocted on our own without being stirred by the Word of God to motivate us into doing His will? Is it our will to go do this? And what people will do, even within the evangelical churches... They'll dream up and conjure up these things to do, and they'll go do them. Because it's busy activity, supposedly for the Lord. Matthew 7 says, they're going out there healing people, they're doing all these great works, and wonderful works, but I don't know them. We need to be doing, as Jesus says, only those are going to go to heaven who do my will. Living by faith means we don't live by sight. 
We don't make our decisions based on what we have or what we think we can get. We base our decisions on God's expectation. What did He say? Give them to eat. There was some food available. What they were supposed to do is give people to eat. God does the multiplying. We try to figure out how are we going to multiply it. We can raise money. We can send them to town. Uh, we can go to town and buy it. We try, we try to figure out how we can do that. Let God do the multiplying. Let God do the math. Let God give the victory. And don't try to envision what victory or success looks like because it may not be what we think it is. It may, in fact, look like failure to us. Take Noah. He preached 120 years. He was a preacher of righteousness, according to the Apostle Peter. He was a preacher of righteousness for 120 years. When he started preaching, he didn't know nobody would come. He didn't know that. But by faith, he started preaching and he started building the ark. He did it by faith. But you know what an average person would say about the finished product? <laughs> It was a complete failure. Nobody came onto the ark. Excuse me. But isn't that how what God used to save mankind? It was only one family that was saved off the earth. It was Noah and his family. Who would have ever thought that would be success? But that's what it was. So just because it doesn't turn out the way, because we're thinking all of our friends and our neighbors and our relatives, they're all going to come and we're going to have a, a good time and we're going to make it someplace else and we're going to go. No. Let God determine what the results are. Don't try to figure it out ahead because you're going to be disappointed if you put your own vision on it. We have to get the instructions from the Lord. And He doesn't speak to us today like He did to the Old Testament prophets, but He still speaks to people today through His Word. So it all comes down to this. You've got to get in the Word. If you really have faith in the Lord, you'll dig into the Word. Find out what His will is for your life. How to live your life. How to make decisions. How to relate to other people. How to handle your money. What you do as an employee, it's all there. We just need to go to the Word. And, you know, we're looking for this good thing to do that might impress other people. God may want you to do some menial thing that impresses nobody. But if that's God's will, God's going to bless you for having done it. And God will reap the results of whatever that may be. After all, Paul said, you know, some... Some are thinking Apollos is great. Some thinking Peter's great. Some think I'm great. We're nothing. We're just laborers in the field. And when we plant and we water, God gives the increase. So whatever that increase looks like. And so you look into the New Testament and say, wow, 5,000 people saved in one day. 2,000 people saved in one day. That's what success looks like. God doesn't work the same way every time. Doesn't work the same way every time. You say, well... We got, it. We, got, we got people going out and, and they're witnessing to people and we're not finding anybody saved. We're preaching the Word nobody's being saved. Let God determine whether it's successful or not. Our obligation is to follow the lead of the Lord and to do His will. Everything else is up to the Lord. We just need to individually put our faith in Christ, not walk by sight, but by every word that God has given to us. That will be success. Not something else we might envision. Let's stand together. Father, we thank You for speaking to our hearts today. We pray, Father, that if there's any here that do not have faith in Christ, maybe they have discovered that today. Maybe You have revealed that to them today. Maybe You have convicted somebody today that they really don't have faith in Christ. They shouldn't be embarrassed about that. They should rejoice in knowing that there is a plan of salvation and all it takes is to have their faith in Christ having repented of their sins. It's that simple. And Father, we trust that anyone who's here today who's lost would put their faith in You and that they would testify of that even today. And Father, for the Christian that's here who's been walking by sight instead of by faith, we pray, Father, that we would be convicted wherein we have uh, missed the mark in, in any of those and all of those areas. And Father, that You would instill within us a desire and a passion to just do Your will 
and not to add anything to it or subtract anything from it. To simply do your will, not looking at what we have, not looking at what we think we can do, not looking at what we might consider success, but simply looking to your word for direction and guidance that we might do your will. We'll give you thanks and praise for all that you've done here in this hour. For it's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen.